I went with, um, with my sister and her husband in Chicago. I was in school at the time, well, finishing school, working in, in Chicago. And there was some kind of jewelry show coming into Chicago. And I went to this place, massive, I think it might have been even McCormick Place or something like that. And it was, it was a jewelry trade show of some kind. And I walked in, and there was sparkly things all over the place. I mean, I don't know how much money was in that, in that building that day, but it must have been millions and millions and millions of dollars because every booth had precious metals and jewels of all kind. If I was a pirate, I'd be like, Arr, this is this is my time right here. Well, I ended up buying, uh, buying this, this gold ring, and I've had it, I've had it since. And, and then later on, I, I got this very cheap metal ring here, but it's actually a sturdy metal. And the reason I got it on my right hand is because it has a cross on it. Well, let me tell you, I, that moment when I bought the ring, um, it was a very big, defining moment for me. And, and, and this is what we're doing we're, in our sermon series. We're looking at these big moments in the life of King David. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever went to buy a ring for his wife, but he certainly had some treasure, King David. Uh, <clears throat> so as, as we have looked back, we are actually towards the tail end of our sermon series. And the sermon series we call it Count Me In. Uh, but we've looked at these key moments in, in David's commitment towards God. Uh, these, these are some of the iconic moments in, in David's life. The, the moment when he was anointed to be king. When he defeated the giant Goliath. When he was singing songs to a tormented king, King Saul. And then we moved on and we, we looked at other moments in time in, in King David's life. And he was on the run. His journey took him in many places, many adventures. And, and as we look at, at what happened in King David's life, we've used these key moments to look at, at, at three kinds of commitments. Commitment to God. A personal commitment to God. Commitment to each other. Commitment to the team. To the fact that we are together. Commitment to us. And then the third kind of commitment is commitment to investment. Commitment to investment. And last week we actually looked at uh, time. Investment of time. Because we speak in terms of commitment of time, talent, and treasure. Uh, last week, as we looked at time, the investment of time can be and should be, and it is a sweet time, a precious time, because from our perspective, time can be such at a premium, especially in our society. Time seems to go and not return. So, time seems to flow, and it's gone. I wonder how God sees time. Do you ever wonder about that? How does God see time? I mean, he created it. He invented it. How does he see time? How does he interact with time? I have a theory about that. So if you guys want to hear my nerd theory, you can come talk to me afterwards. Well, probably not today because I have to run to a funeral. But come, come talk to me next week, perhaps. But for us, time... Uh, can be at a premium, and also time can be abundant. We find ourselves filled with time, time to spare. We all have the same moments to spend. We all have the same exact moment right now. But it's precious because we never know when our time in life will end. Investing time in searching for God is absolutely worthwhile. Because when it's all said and done, nothing else will matter. But our commitment uh, to investment also includes talent and treasure. And in particular today, I'd like to explore treasure. 
So let's continue at our key moments in the life of King David. And we've been using 1 Samuel as, as an anchor point in, this, in the Bible and the Scripture. So please turn, if you have your electronic Bibles like I do, or paper uh, Bibles, there are some pew Bibles as well around you. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 26. 1 Samuel chapter 26. Take a moment, find that out. By the way, I love when you all bring your, your fancy schmancy electronic Bibles. You know, it's so great, right? You just search, put the thing in, and boom, you're there. I, I love it. I, you know, if you all, you know, are into social media, you know, by, by all means, take selfies. I mean, there are some nice things around here you can take selfies with. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so just, is that enough time? You guys are there? It's First Samuel chapter 26. Let me read that, uh, the first uh, 12 verses to you, <clears throat> starting with verse 1. The Ziphites went to Saul in Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding in the hill of, um, oh Lord, I practice this. It's Hekilah, Hak- Hekilah, I think so. All right, you're with me? You're reading that? Great, fantastic. See, even pastors struggle with that, so you're, you're totally good when you can't pronounce those names. All right, so David hiding the hill of Hekilah, which faces Jeshimon. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph, and, three, and with his 3,000 select Israelite troops. Wow, that's a lot of them. The, to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill, on the hill of Hekilah. Hik- Halakah, uh, facing Jeshman, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Amner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had laid down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, the son of Zeriah, Joab's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul. (laughs) Yeah, going straight into the enemy, right? Hey, who wants to go to the enemy camp? Let's go. Let's get captured. No, not quite, right? Oh, well, Abishai speaks up. He said, I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there was Saul laying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into our hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't struck him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die. Or or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. So right about now you're thinking, okay, hang on a second. Did you read the wrong passage? Right? I thought you were going to talk about treasure. Uh, I promise you I'll explain myself uh, how this relates. But to do so, in order to, to understand the relationship between this pas- passage and treasure, we actually need to explore how we look at treasure. When I walked into that warehouse filled with jewelry, I had a certain look. I looked in a certain way at treasure. I think it's important for us to take a look at our look of treasure. Now, one way we think about the investment of treasure is to look at what we have and then decide what percentage we give away to someone else, like the church or a missionary or a nonprofit or somebody in need, a neighbor. I believe all of us are familiar with that, right? I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, do me a favor, uh, if you could, uh, this, is, this is real, just take your wallet, 
out right now. See, I have actually, I put mine out here already. I have my wallet here. So go ahead, take your wallet out. Take your wallet out, just put it, put it out. See, it, it's my real wallet, it's, it's not a fake wallet. I put it right here. By the, by the way, it's been here all this time. No one took it. I'm impressed with you all, folks. But I, I, take, your, take your wallet out, it's, it's gonna be important. See, I'm gonna, it's gonna be important to, to you because this is one way we look at, at treasure. I know it's hard to get out, isn't it? To, to get out the wallet. If you may not, okay, some of you, but I don't have a wallet. I just keep my, I, okay, take whatever you put your IDs in, your money, your credit cards, but just take it out. Put it in your hands. Feel it. Touch it. It's going to be important. This, this is part of your worship <laughs> service this morning. I remember one sermon, one, one pastor did the same thing, and, and, and then, of course, to the dismay of the congregation, said, now take your wallet and pass it to the person to the right. And everybody's like, oh, man, do I have to do that? Yeah, you have to do that. So, so everybody passes the, the, the wallet to the person to the right, and they're eyeing it, and they're thinking, okay, what, what are they going to do with my wallet, right? And of course, the pastor, you know, tongue in cheek, says, now give like you've never given before. You know, you're giving somebody else's money. And of course, what I think the pastor was trying to do is trying to show how difficult it is to, to, to get something out of our control that we like to have control over. I'm having a difficult time with the concept of giving a portion of treasure to someone else. I have, a, I have a difficult time with that concept. And it's probably not for the reasons that are generally mentioned in sermons or among friends or neighbors. You see, the reason I have a hard time with the concept of giving of our treasure, I have a, I have a hard time with it reconciling it with a concept of stewardship. The concept of stewardship. Let me explain what, uh, what I mean. Um, let me explain it to you this way. Uh, once there was a rich couple who owned a very, very lucrative business. And this couple absolutely loved art. They loved art. I know many of you here love art and artistic expression. I personally love art as well. Uh, they wanted to share their love for art with their employees. So what they did is they arranged all the hallways in a paste way, of course, and all the conference rooms and all the offices. Uh, they, they filled them with paintings and with, with potteries and, and, and beautiful tapestry, things that were beautifully and artistically made. Now, because the business was doing so well, they left the running and management of the company to three couples. Uh, and these couples served as executive vice presidents of the company. They were in charge. They, they were the ones that, that did absolutely everything, uh, put together all the plans, managed all the employees, uh, and, and the owners really didn't have to do anything. Now, every year, the, the business owners threw a very lavish Christmas party. And, of course, the, the three executive uh, vice presidents, the three couples, were invited. Now, at the party, each couple brought a gift. And this, this is not unheard of. You know, it's, it's very appropriate to bring your employer, especially when they throw a lavish party, to, to bring them a gift. The first one brought an exquisite giant painting. And this painting was absolutely breathtaking. The second brought a medium-sized sculptured figure. And it was exquisite as well. And the third couple brought a small but very beautiful, very ornate ceramic. At the right time, of course, the host got up to speak. And with a smile, they said something like, We absolutely love all the art pieces you brought for us today. We, we think they're absolutely exquisite. We, we, we think the world uh, of them. And, and this, this couple proceeded to say that in spite of the different sizes and artistic mediums, each one is very, very precious to us. It's so precious to us, and it's precious because we distinctly remember when we purchased each piece and placed it very carefully in your offices at the company. I'm glad you see that they are in good condition and they've been kept safe. Stewardship. 
These three couples brought to the owners what the owners already owned. But they were placed in charge of those things. If we are stewards of what God has entrusted us, then the concept of giving of our treasure doesn't seem to line up, at least in my head. It's hard. How can we say, Lord, we are investing our treasure when we as stewards of his treasure to begin with? How can we say, Lord, I'm going to bring something back to you when actually all that's in here is a gift from him? That which exchanges our hands is not our treasure. We are only uh, taking care of that which has been entrusted to us. Perhaps a more appropriate way to look at the treasure and how it aligns with what, what Jesus said about treasure. In Matthew uh, chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 20, Jesus said the following, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus says, invest in the right treasures. Invest in the right treasure. In other words, when we consider treasure, we can look at it as we have here, you know, as we have surrounding us, we can, we can see what, what we have, that the tangible things. Or we can look at what is stored and promised to us through Christ. The stuff that surrounds us is not ours to begin with because we're actually stewards of it. What do you have right now that has not been given to you. Perhaps you might think, well, I, I work for it. I have some degrees, you know, I can go in my office, I have a big you know, plaque, look, I, I did all this, I have degrees, and I... Yeah, but who gave you the strength? Who gave you the wisdom? Who gave you the capability? Who gave you the means? So we should consider not an investment of our treasure, but an investment in our treasure. Do you understand the difference? Do you catch the difference? We should consider not an investment of our treasure, but an investment in our treasure. In the same chapter, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says the following, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, not about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and body more than clothing. See what you fret about the stuff around us? We, can, we constantly think about these kinds of questions, right? That's because we think of our, of our treasures as ours. And because it's ours, we need to control it. We need to be able to allocate it properly. And of course, we need to control it because it's always at risk. You know, those darn moths, those vermin that destroy it. There's a chance that thieves could come and break in and steal it. It's ours. We know it doesn't last. We know it doesn't last. We know it's going to be gone. Nothing reminds us that it's going to be gone and we can't take it with us. Except when we mourn the passing of a loved one. So we cling to the stuff that we can control tighter and tighter. But Jesus continues in verse 33. Let me read that again. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And this is key. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So what's the treasure? What is that that cannot be touched by anyone? The kingdom of God. So as we consider the commitment to investment, I'd like us to approach... I like to approach the discussion as an investment in our treasure, not of our treasure, our perceived treasure.
treasure, our stuff that we are tempted to call our treasure. Now, okay, so now that we know how to look at it, what about the passage that I read earlier in 1 Samuel, the, the one about King David? Uh, I told you I'd return to it. Here it is. 1 Samuel 26. I believe that David recognizes his real treasure, not an opportunistic benefit that he could just grab. I believe David understands what real treasure is. See, his treasure wasn't to kill Saul. That wasn't his promise. The, the, the Lord didn't come to him and say, okay, I'm going to anoint you so that you can go and kill the previous king. David knew that God promised him the kingdom. Isn't it interesting how David promised David a kingdom? And then Jesus says, seek the kingdom. You realize that y'all have been promised the kingdom. Jesus promises you a kingdom just like David was promised a kingdom. So you might be similar to David. You're sort of in David's shoes. And David believed God. So in light of the promised kingdom, I believe it was a no-brainer for David to choose the kingdom rather than the opportunity to of a quick fix to remove God's anointed, as David calls him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him down to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. David recognized that the real prize was not the death of his predecessor, King Saul. So what does David do? David decides to invest in the kingdom. To bank on it. The only real treasure I know of is the kingdom of God. So the real question is, not, is no longer how much or what percentage do I give of this wallet of mine. But rather, am I really seeing myself as a steward of what God has entrusted? Am I really seeing myself and believing that the kingdom is the only worthwhile investment that I'm willing to make. If so, then the percentage is very simple, right? Think of the percentage. What's the right percentage? Everything. Everything. That's the right percentage. We're stewards. In God's economy, things seem to go backwards sometimes. It's God's anyway. He's the rightful owner, right? Which means that the question becomes, Lord, not how much do I give to you, what percentage do I give, but Lord, what would you have me do? What response do you want from me with my time, talent, and treasure? What would you like to, me to, to do with these resources that you've put here around me? How should I invest them in your kingdom? What what what? Purposes do you have for me and for the stuff? See, when posed like that, you really are doing what that pastor wanted to do. Give like it's not yours. <laughs> it's not. Give of your time, talent, treasure. Invest in the kingdom as if it's somebody else's money. Well, it is. But see, David also did another thing. He exercised wisdom when he faced the unknowns. He exercised wisdom when he faced unknowns. King David did not know the full extent of God's plan, correct? He said, hey, I'm going to trust God's plan, uh, and I'm not going to kill God's anointed. But he had no clue what would happen. He, 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 he only knew first step one, two, or three. So David had to do exactly what we should do when we don't know the, uh, what's going to happen, when we are faced with unknowns. Use wisdom and take small steps. Take small steps. And David did. I mean, a big step would have been take the spear, pin the man down, kill him, boom. The old king is gone. 
But uh, David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on God's anointing and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he says, the Lord himself will strike him. The Lord himself will strike him. And then David says, oh, wait, wait, or, or, or maybe, or his time will come and he will die. Or, or, or wait, wait, or, or maybe, maybe he will just go into the battle and perish. I can just <laughs> see David like, well, uh, maybe it'll be this. And, or, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. But I just, one thing I know, I'm not going to go for the quick fix, the shortcut. Poor David, I feel for him. I mean, I feel like he's grasping his straws. He has no idea how King Saul will die or he'll, how he'll be removed. No idea. But he's sure of one thing. Verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. So, he uses wisdom and takes small steps. He says, now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. Wow, David, what an opportunity. You missed it. No, he didn't. He knew who owned everything. He knew the real treasure. He knew how to invest in the kingdom. He took a leap. He trusted. It's logical when you think of it, right? I mean, this is not blind faith. This is not a blind leap. It's logical. He couldn't trust. See, the, the thing is, David could not trust his own limited understanding or rely uh, on, on knowing the full picture. So he had to do something else. He had to rely on the one person who really did know everything, who really did understand how the kingdom will come about. So it makes logical sense to put faith and trust in that person. Even if the path seems like it will not deliver the real treasure, the kingdom. I mean, letting the old king continue to rule doesn't feel like it's the right path. By the way, that's often the case with God. These kinds of shortcuts seem really good, but they rarely are. They don't lead to good outcomes. Don't put in the work, take the shortcut, the devil says. He would love for us to not pursue the real treasure, but invest in the mirage. So the devil would love to confuse you as to the real treasure. The devil would love to tempt you to take the shortcut and a drastic decision away from God. Don't fall for it. Commit yourselves to an investment time. Don't skimp. It's internally important. And with all your talent, all your resources, all your wisdom, all your knowledge, commit yourself to investing in the treasure, the real treasure, the only real treasure there is around. So I want to leave you with the words that Jesus said in Matthew 6. And these are key. We read them earlier, but I want you to take them. I want you to underline them. I want you to take them for yourself. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. I'm going to say that again because some of us need to hear that again. Therefore, therefore, because these things will be given to you, because you have sought the kingdom, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, <laughs> you know what? Tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Why are you piling out worry that you should have tomorrow on today? Why are you borrowing? Why are you loaning worry into today? That'd be like putting weight on you that you should be carrying tomorrow. Well, I think I'm going to carry it today too. No. Put it down. Leave it for tomorrow. Some things are better left 
for the next day. And some things are not. I know. I, I, I get that. But do not worry about tomorrow. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we think about the investment that you made into the treasure. <clears throat> as I consider the fact that you invested, and, and your investment was costly. Your investment was beyond expensive. You invested the life of the Lord Jesus. And you invested in a treasure that, to my mind, Lord, how can it possibly be? You invested in us. It's so amazing to think. It's so gracious to think. It's so unfathomable. It, it is beyond words to think that you consider us your treasure. Lord, how can it be? How can you have such love? How can you have such justice? How can you have such mercy? How can you... It, Lord, bring peace in our brain even when we don't understand why you've chosen to invest in us. Bring peace that we are worth investing into. Don't let us struggle with thoughts of self-doubt and self-deprecation. Lord Jesus, help, help us understand our identity in you, who we are in you. And with that, I want to say thank you for choosing to invest in us, in your treasure. And Lord, our desire this morning is that we will invest in the real treasure, in the kingdom, and his righteousness, your righteousness, Lord Jesus. May it be, may you be the real treasure for us. May we have the right eyes to see the real treasure. May we not be uh, bamboozled by the evil. May we not be bamboozled by the mirage of other treasures. And Lord, when we face times of uncertainty, when we face the unknowns, Lord, give us wisdom. Please give us wisdom and help us take significant small steps so that we may draw closer and closer to you and to the kingdom. So, Father, I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus, our real treasure, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.